is Sarah Hartman, and welcome to our Chocolate Masters Hangouts. Today I'd like to welcome Richard Tango Lawi, who is the flavor coach for Ecole Chocolat's Chocolate Boot Camp, and also owner of Dancing Lion Chocolate, and Jeff Volkers, who's the savory chef at Dancing Lion Chocolate. Welcome. Um, those of you who have watched our previous Hangouts will remember that we've discussed chocolate flavor before, um, touching on how genetics, terroir, post-harvest processing, roasting, and conching all contribute to the final flavor of any chocolate. For today's conversations, we're focused on you and how we can all become chocosaurs. It just takes a little knowledge, um, a lot of tasting, and sharing with good friends. Rich will take you through how he educated himself to be a chocolate super taster and why he believes that to enjoy chocolate to the fullest, you first need to do your homework. And then savory chef Jeff Volkers will talk about his love affair with chocolate and how he incorporates different chocolate flavors into his dishes. Um, so Rich, um, can you tell us a little bit about where and how we should get started with chocolate? Absolutely, Sarah. We're going to start with a few ingredients I'm going to pass under your nose quickly, and then we'll kind of move by. Let's see if I can get this in front of our camera. A little lower. There you we go. Have some mangoes. We have some red peppers. Oh. We have some thyme. Guess what? We're going to make something today. We have some onions. We have some beautiful golden tomato. And we have, of course, a few other things, but of course we have some chocolate. Of course. <laughs> I'm going to pass this off to Savory Chef Jeff. While we talk, is going to go turn this into something that we can talk about how we do it and where the chocolate comes from a little bit later on in the talk. Okay, nice. Um, so let's see. I love chocolate and all its flavors and all its glories. Um, so I guess a good way for us to start is, isn't that enough? Um, why do you think it's so important for a chocolate lover like me um, to learn more about chocolate flavors? Well, it actually is enough. And sometimes I just like to put some chocolate in my mouth and not think about it and <laughs> completely enjoy it mindlessly. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, I actually like to taste my and experience my chocolate. Mm -hmm. I like to know what's going on. I like to know where those flavor nuances might be coming from. I like to know where it might be being grown and you know what the characters, what the characters are. And and I find that that really enhances the experience of enjoying the chocolate. You know, I can I can know that yeah, I taste a set of Madagascar and it's really beautiful this year. Um, and what I can expect from it. And I think that can enhance your experience of of the chocolate. It's a little bit of knowledge. Not necessary, but it goes a long way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like studying, um, getting to know really um, what you can appreciate from different places where the chocolate comes from, where the cocoa comes from, um, that can really help guide you through the experience. It really can. Understanding the cacao and how it becomes chocolate and where how the processing affects the flavor and experience of the chocolate and how, even to, to the extent of how we experience chocolate physiologically, mm -hmm. uh, it can make enjoying a chocolate greater. I would say that over my years of tasting chocolate, my enjoyment, I eat less, my enjoyment of it has increased. Interesting. That's very interesting. So you said physiologically. Do you think um, my taste buds, for example, could be trained to pick up different nuances of flavor in chocolate? Oh, absolutely. Our taste buds. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay. We've actually had several super tasters come into our shop. Uh -huh. And that actually is not necessarily easy for us because I bet. the way we taste things, the actual taste, the taste buds, super tasters theoretically have more taste buds crammed mm -hmm. in, and so they get more extreme sensitivity to what they're tasting. Okay. But taste isn't just about the taste buds. There are many other things that happen. And if you're a super taster, that can really imbalance your experience with so what I've really found is most of us eat things, but we don't really pay attention to what we are experiencing when we're consuming. Okay. And learning to pay attention makes a big difference. About 20 years ago, I just started keeping a notebook. Mm -hmm. It wasn't formal about I taste this or this. It was just I would close my eyes, put some chocolate in my mouth, and start writing down what came into my brain. Okay. That's and a fun way to do it. 
that is still how I taste things. It's just what I write has become a little bit more detailed okay. and a little bit more guided, but it really has just evolved from that. It's, okay. uh, um, I, many years ago, I actually went through a wine connoisseur course and learned how to taste wine. Mm -hmm. And I find that I prefer tasting chocolate. I and I, I hope in some ways that we don't get as formal as that, because um, the chocolate there's, there's just so many beautiful things that happen. And when you become more attuned to paying attention to it, you just experience them all. Yeah. So, what sort of activities or experiences would you recommend to developing a more refined palate, or to really developing your palate? Well, there are a few things you have to think about. One is that what you taste changes during the day and during the week and with your mood and depending upon what you've been eating before. Okay. And a few other things. Um, and probably the humidity and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, so the first thing is when we get a new chocolate, I taste that chocolate maybe six or eight times over two weeks. Sometimes, probably many more times than that. And the okay. taste changes. And our staff at the shop have all learned to taste chocolate, and they find the same thing. They'll say, you know, it tastes this way one day, and this way a different day. Mm -hmm. And it's very true. That happens. Um, the flavor of a chocolate, um, I just entirely forgot what you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> so basically, uh, we were talking about what sort of activities and how can you... Um, oh, yes. Develop your palate, right? There, there are a couple. So when I when I started taking notes, one thing I realized is that you can't take a snapshot of what a chocolate tastes like. You just can't say it has notes of this and this and that. It doesn't really work that way. Okay. Um, when you put a chocolate in your mouth, you get a taste, mm -hmm. and it's no aromatic yet. You just get the taste on your tongue of what the what's hitting your taste buds. But then that cocoa butter in that chocolate starts to flow and it melts. Mm -hmm. and there's some physics that goes on behind that. And the flavor starts to expand throughout your mouth and it starts, the molecules start to get up into your nasal passages near your, your sinuses where you detect aroma. And then you start to get the fragrances and it start, the chocolate will start to open up and become more complex and more nuanced, hopefully. And more things happen. And then slowly the taste fades away and the aroma starts to fade away, but there will be aftertaste where the chocolate lingers. And every chocolate is different. Some come and they go very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, some of the really beautiful Criollo chocolates, like the Soconoscos and some of the Guatemalans we taste will, and, and others, will linger in your mouth for 20 minutes and wow. can be really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, that's a wonderful thing for us when we make bonbons because I can play with what the initial taste is and then I can play with what happens in your mouth after as the fragrance develops and then I can play with the aftertaste. Okay. And it allows me to have bonbons. Sometimes it'll change flavors three or four times over 10 or 15 minutes. Wow. And, and it's wonderful. We don't always get that, but it's wonderful to be able to do it. When the chocolates have those characters, you can really play off of them. Okay. Enjoy. So the temporal aspect of chocolate, to me, is very important. That mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You may taste certain notes at the beginning, but then it may develop into other things, and then it may develop into other things. And how quickly it develops depends on the amount of cocoa butter in the chocolate. If the chocolate's very fluid, the flavor flows very quickly and things happen. If the flavor, uh -huh. if the chocolate doesn't have a lot of cocoa butter, it's very, very viscous. Uh -huh. the, the, um, the cocoa liquor molecules just sort of stick densely into your taste buds and the taste uh -huh. is much more intense, which also explains why um, a chocolate can be, we have some chocolates that are very, very high percentage, 80 or 90 percent, that taste uh -huh. very smooth and soft. Yes. We have other chocolates uh, sixty percent that taste very dark and very intense. Mm -hmm. uh, Valrhona's Carabe comes to mind. It's a you know a Caribbean blend that, that just always has a very strong taste to me, but it's not a very high percentage. Okay. So so when we taste chocolate, when I taste chocolate, we we let all the other stuff go. We let the percentages and everything we know about it go. We close our eyes and we just see what happens. Okay, interesting. So the label itself, you're not arrested to that label. You're really letting your own experience and your own mindfulness guide you, right? Very much so. Okay, um, well, I just use the label to decide if I'm going to bother to taste the chocolate. But, mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, so, I in the intro, I mentioned the term chocosaur. Um, what do you think of our cheeky term, um, chocosaur, to label those chocolate lovers who take chocolate flavor seriously? It's cheeky. <laughs> A mouthful. A mouthful. 
And uh, that's two puns in one sentence. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think it's cute and I like it. But like I said, I'm a little cautious about people getting too serious about tasting chocolate. We see some of that in the industry now. And when it when it ceases to become just a beautiful a beautiful experience and it starts to become um, amongst consumers, I mean, I, I, those in the business, we have to taste very mindfully and very carefully, mm -hmm. and formally. But, but amongst the consumers, when it starts getting away from just the experience and starting to pay attention to, well, I only eat 85% from wherever. Mm -hmm. Because it has these notes, I want this. Yeah, that starts to me to, to detract from the beauty of the chocolate itself. Okay, and the experience. And the um, experience. So chocolate sewers, casually, I like. If we started using it formally, I might get a little concerned. Okay, okay. Very good feedback. Um, how about transforming? So you have consumers who really love chocolate for the... I don't like using this word, but the candy aspect of it. So they just like it because it's sweet, because they get their chocolate fix. And then you have those who are at the other end of the game who are take chocolate flavor seriously. Have you been able to take the ones in their for in the candy department towards a more appreciative experience of chocolate? Um, we actually find that transition happens pretty naturally in our shop. Okay. You're in Manchester, New Hampshire, which is not known for being a, a couture chocolate capital of the world by any okay. means. <laughs> and more, many of the locals, and people coming from all over, but the locals, when we first opened, were really used to candy. I mean, they get very sweet chocolate and fudges mm -hmm. and things, and that's just not what we do. Um, and what we found is that most people seem to be open to trying, and okay. when they try, they see it as something entirely different. So mm -hmm. we don't see that we compete with candy because we don't make candy. Exactly. But people, same thing. When you want candy, you want candy, and, and a beautiful piece of chocolate isn't really what you want. And when mm -hmm. you want chocolate, you want chocolate, and mm -hmm. candy isn't going to do it. Okay. Okay. Um, so, Rich, you spend a lot of your business time in sourcing out new chocolate flavors and textures. Um, how did you become so fascinated with chocolate flavor? <laughs> About 20 years ago, I actually found a recipe to make chocolate truffles from chocolate chips, and I tried it. It, of course, didn't work. <laughs> and, you know, you have to remember, we didn't exactly have the World Wide Web back then. <laughs> and so I had this sludge because chocolate chips, well, as it turns out, really aren't chocolate, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was fortunate to find a book that told me about the, that explained the word couverture chocolate, the real mm -hmm. stuff. But then, 20 years ago, Finding Kubitscher chocolate in the United States wasn't really very easy to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, even most of the high-end gourmet stores didn't really have seriously good chocolate. I actually found a chocolate tier that sold me a kilo of a Valrhona. I don't even know what it was, and I became in love. And after that, I just started searching out chocolates from everywhere. Shops, when we okay. go to cities, we'd, we'd, we'd buy whatever we can and start tasting, keeping my notebook. And... Um, and about that same time, I also started trying to learn things like tempering, thinking, how hard could it be? Silly me. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, started, I started to just really taste. And it took years to really start to develop and understand. I look at my notes from way back when, and I think, oh, that was kind of amusing. Um, <laughs> but I've also, one of the things over the years I've gotten out of the habit of doing is judging my chocolate. Okay, when I put a piece of chocolate in my mouth, I don't think good or bad. I think, what's going on? Okay. Would I use it? Would I not use it? How would I use it? Um, and that's a little bit hard for people to learn. Our staff, um, as they learn, have to learn that as well. And it's not easy to get out of the habit of saying, I don't like this chocolate. But yes. instead saying, okay, well, yeah, I'm finding this a little bit soapy. And I know that probably means it's a little bit overground. Um, or, you know, there's some characteristics, a little burlap -y. We've got some issues here probably with the fermentation and a dry, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I know to pay attention to that. Now, back then I had no clue. I would say, I don't like this one. Okay. Um, but over the years, just tasting, I, as I started getting into working with chocolate more and really falling in love with it and sourcing more, I ended up finding what really got me the first was I stumbled onto a bar. I don't even know where it came from. It happened to be a one of those rare, not a lot of the made, don't exist anymore, Steve DeBreeze Costa Ricans a bunch of years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. It, it blew my world, and I picked up the phone, and I called Steve. And I awesome. said, I don't know who you are, but you're making amazing chocolate. And we ended up talking for hours. Oh, wow. Um, and that kind of opened my mind a lot. He gave me a lot of resources, mm -hmm. uh, what to read, what to look for, what to think about. 
And uh, you know, my chocolate making was getting getting better along those lines. And and then a couple of years after that, I had another one of those experiences. I picked up in a market in Montreal a bar of Alan McClure's Patrick's um, Madagascar 67%. And I had never tasted anything like that. If you've not tasted Alan's Madagascar 67%, it's like it's something exploding in your mouth. It's this incredibly clear, clean, bright. This year, back then it was a very bright plum note. It's like, like getting to the center of a plum in the summer that's just perfect. And uh -huh. it just makes your eyes roll back. And that's what that chocolate tasted like. Mm -hmm. And, and you probably weren't expecting it. Not at all. I never tasted chocolate like that. I mean, I knew the chocolates were all different, but I never tasted chocolate like that. Mm -hmm. uh, picked up the phone, called Alan. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, you know, since then I, you know, I spent some time at Oakville Shock a lot, and you know, Valrona, and and uh, you know, classes with Pam. And but what is really focused around us for us is not so much just making things, but making things to play off these beautiful chocolates that change mm -hmm. with each harvest, and they're always different, and they're alive. And um, after that, I actually ended up over the years working with working with Alan. He now makes our custom blend chocolates mm -hmm. with a lot of Madagascar in them because I love it. And uh, and when we make a chocolate, it's about three months of design time to go back and forth. Oh, God. Uh, Jeff just brought something that smells amazing. Uh, <laughs> it's about three months of design time to craft the flavor profile. What you know, we, we did our 70% dark milk, our Kenji chocolate. I got the first batch. I said, yeah, it's beautiful, but I want more acidity. I want a little mm -hmm. bit more acidity back in my throat. And now the next batch comes back, and we got a little more acidity. And, and you know, that's how we do things. You know, it's, yeah. This is the experience I want for the chocolate I want to work with, knowing the flavors will change. It's it's a true craft, right? It, it, it's it's it, balancing all these flavors together. Oh, it is, and they're so spectacular, and they're fun to work with. And what Isn't I think that? is very interesting um, for you at Dancing Lion Chocolate is that you only make one bonbon recipe at a time, right? And that when that bonbon is sold out, you move on to creating another completely different recipe. Um, and I bet that this has something to do with the curiosity that you have with these chocolate flavors. It actually has to do with a few things. One is that the chocolate changes. So you're right. We make a bonbon recipe once. We we'll make between 20 and 200 of a piece. And uh, when it's gone, it's gone. Wow. Okay. Uh, some of the chocolates we use are very rare. You don't save one, two. <laughs> <laughs> they have shelf life. They don't say when they're gone, they're gone. Uh, we, you know, over the holidays, we got our hands on two ounces of Sam Adams Utopia beer. It's this incredibly rare stuff. It's like $70 an ounce. Oh, wow. and, uh, and we paired it with a Guatemalan, Finca Las Ajusta, 60%, which is as complex and beautiful. This beer tastes like cognac, and, and it doesn't wow. taste like beer. Mm -hmm. And we made about 60 truffles, because mm -hmm. that's all we had to make. I mean, we scaled down the ganache for the amount of beer we had to get the perfect flavor, and mm -hmm. that's what we did. And uh, a lot of our chocolates are that way. The chocolates change. But that's one reason. The other is because, for us, making stuff is art. When we construct a bonbon, it is an artistic process. How is it going to look? What's the experience? What's the mood? What should the, the consumer, the person who puts that in their mouth, take away? How should they feel? It mm -hmm. ends with how we name it because that affects that. Um, mm -hmm. And then we make another one. So we're always having to learn and improve. And as we've gone forward with the business, we've extended that to everything. We make brownies with a lot of chocolate, cocoa butter based, that um, we make a batch one week and we never we do something else the next week. Okay. And our savory work, because we serve lunch and we do it at the shop every day and we make amazing wild dinners periodically, we do the same thing. We, we figure out what we want to make through our experience. Mm -hmm. We don't make it until we make it the very first time for the event. And I don't think we've duplicated anything savory-wise either. Ever. Wow. Yeah, that's a very intense creative process. Well, and it's very it beautiful. is because when you're making a dish and you have a small amount of a very expensive chocolate, you can't mess it up. Exactly. <laughs> very good at, at really being able to, to use our senses, our smell, our taste, and our experience mm -hmm. to determine what's going to work in the experiment so that when we actually make it, we know it's going to be what we want. Yeah. So do you want to tell us what you have over there? Pass on the smell. All right, I'm going to tell the camera over here, so hopefully you can see this. Ooh, oh, wow, that's, cool. that's beautiful. It's so colorful. I'll let Jeff talk to that. Okay. So... Whenever we, whenever we try and get chocolate into a dish, we normally we either taste all the ingredients of the dish first individually, mm -hmm. or we make it and then we try it with several different chocolates just to see what goes best. Chances are, if I give Rich something to taste, 
a chocolate will jump right out of his head, and he'll be like, we need to use this. Okay. But uh, normally, if he's not around, I'll make my dish, and then I'll, I'll pair, like, I'll bring, like, six chocolates out, and I'll just try them all individually to see which one goes best. Mm -hmm. um, so right here, what we have... Oh, my, that smells good. So right in here, all we have is onions, peppers, uh, mango, a little bit of uh, orange heirloom tomatoes, and some fresh thyme, a little bit of salt, pepper, and paprika. So it's okay. a very, very fresh flavors in this pan, very bright, fruity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, right yeah, we have not brought the chocolate in yet. We have not brought any chocolate okay. in yet. Right now, we So have... but before we bring it in, let's, once you set that aside, let's taste the chocolate. Very good idea. Can we taste the chocolate? Huh? All right. I have here a little dish. I'm going to put this in front so we can see it. There we go. Okay. The chocolate we're going to taste because I already know we're going to bring this one in. Um, Jeffrey? So we start, of course, by tasting. We start with the snap and the look. It's got a nice okay. snap. I know because I tempered it. It doesn't have a lot of cocoa butter. It's difficult to temper. Now I'm going to smell it. Let me smell. It's huge. Most like, feels like a coffee. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take just a little bit of this. We're going to put on our two front teeth and just nibble it there so we can taste it before it becomes aromatic. Not much cocoa butter. It's pretty sticky. Uh -huh. Butterscotchy, a little smoky. Mm -hmm. A little sweet. Not much fruit. Okay. Eat the rest. Pretend you're, pretend you're tasting, sir. <laughs> Should have mailed her one. Mm. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Develop slowly because there's not a lot of cocoa butter. It takes a little while to unfold. Okay. Huge amounts of fruit. Yeah, now that it's in your mouth. Layers. Lots of other layers. This is um. Is the fruit coming in later? Excuse me. Did the fruit come in later? Oh yeah, fruit's coming in oh, later. Okay, so it's opening. You can you can really smell it or upon like the first nibble, but once it gets back in your palate. Okay. Now I get more like honey, leathery kinds of flavors in it. Definitely like a nutty, almost like a butterscotch. It's moving back towards my throat and the back of my cheeks. It's really moving away from the front of my mouth fairly quickly. Okay. But you pay attention. Some don't do that. So mm -hmm. that means it's more of an aromatic than a taste. This chocolate really is more aromatic than taste. Okay. It's going to have a long aftertaste, a little bit of... Well, that smokiness is still there. It's nice. Yep. Yeah, if you bring enough of this chocolate into a hot dish, you'll actually be able to smell the chocolate. As, as if you would any other ingredient in the dish. Now, this particular chocolate is made by Carlos Eichenberger from, from Danta Chocolate in Guatemala. It's one of our custom blends. We just He just made it for us. We got our first batch last week. It's called Tikal. It's a 43% Criollo milk blend from okay. two plantations. Uh, okay. Think of La Soledad and think of Las Cojistes. And one thing I've noticed about Guatemalan chocolates is they are layered and complex as anything. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we started thinking mangoes, I started, if I were doing this with a bon, doing a bonbon with mango, the first thing I start thinking of is milk chocolates, not too sweet. Um, mm -hmm. The acidity in mangoes can really fight with dark chocolates unless mm -hmm. they, they have a little sweetness in them. Um, but really sweet milk chocolates don't really work so well either because they just muddy things up. Mm -hmm. So this being a pretty dark milk chocolate um, with a really bright fruity flavor in, I think it's going to play off the mango really nicely. But just to round it out for Jeff, we pulled up one other chocolate as well. <laughs> that one is Carabe that I talked about earlier. It's a 66%. It's um, not too acidic, but it has a nice bright flavor to it. And it's round enough, but not muddy, that I think uh, for a dark chocolate, it would probably work pretty well as well. So have so you added the chocolate in there? We just nope. added the chocolate. Okay. And we brought in the tea call for this one. So do you did you just... Sprinkle chocolate? Did you just break it and drop it yeah, into the dish? We broke it up into little pieces and it'll melt in. Um, depending on the application, sometimes we'll put, like if we're doing like a bread pudding or something, we'll put big chunks in it so they won't fully melt so you actually get that as texture in the final dish. Okay. But it, 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 it all depends on what we decide to, what the final and, dish is like. And how would you serve that? Would you serve that as a main course, as a side dish? The uh, chutney we just made? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that will probably just be, I don't know, we, we, we just did a chutney for a family-style vegetarian dinner, and that was like an appetizer course where we made okay. uh, Don Cristini's that they put the chutney on. Um, okay. This could go on anything. Actually, it might even be good on like some, some sort of uh, pan-seared fish, mm -hmm. or, or like maybe even oh, swordfish. Yes, yes. 
So, um, um, so Jeff, I'd love to hear a little bit about you as well. Um, yeah. I hear that you make you know, lunches and dinners at Dancing Lion Chocolate, and everything always has chocolate in it. Yeah, um, as, as of like, how long have you been there? Two years? Two years. As of like two years, I knew nothing about chocolate. I, wow. I knew it was like milk chocolate and like the bulk stuff you'd order to make like huge desserts at a restaurant. Um, and then I got the opportunity to go. He needed help during the winter months to package boxes. Mm -hmm. So I worked there part-time packaging boxes and then... He threw croissants at me. Yep, croissants. I started making croissants, and then we started making uh, sweet bread puddings. Okay. So we started with some really nice sweet bread puddings, and then he's like, one day we were just sitting there, and he's like, he's like, let's go savory. And we were both like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> the craziest idea, and we did it, and it came out fantastic, whether it be the croissants, the chocolate, or just the way we put it together. It was amazing. We got great feedback. So tell us, tell us a little bit about this first experience in the savory dish that you made it, with it was, chocolate. Yeah, yeah, it was it was very interesting. Um, like I said, around that time, I knew nothing about chocolate, so like I was just expanding my flavors, like I always do. I'll try all kinds of food together, but I never brought chocolate into it. And then we started with like sweet bread puddings. Did we bring chocolate into the sweet ones? Yep. Yeah. So we brought chocolate into the sweet ones, which is. I, I don't want to say it's easier to bring chocolate in with dessert, but I feel like it's just, it's default, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just easy. So when we started bringing in herbs and we started bringing in, like, fresh vegetables, it was, it just got way more complex for my palate. Definitely. Def <laughs> definitely made my cooking uh, repertoire a lot better. And can you share with us how do you end up picking the chocolate that goes into a particular dish? It, it, it we really, learned a little bit already, but I'd like to hear a little more about your process. Yeah, it has a lot to do with what goes into the dish. Now that I have an idea of like the base flavors I get with chocolates, I can either start with the chocolate and build based on the fruits okay. and vegetables I want to bring into that, or I can do it vice versa and start with the fruits and vegetables, and then once I have all that together, just go crazy tasting. And um, we... We've had surprisingly amazing luck just tasting until like we, we just started bringing um wine into it, and that's oh, like okay. that's a whole that just added an exponential taste factor onto it. But it, it's do you mean cooking with the wine? So like using wine for yeah, the glazing? Yeah, I started or? doing that. So I'm I'm with wine where I was with chocolate two years ago. Okay. <laughs> but um yeah, it's like just just it's all about knowing the chocolate and knowing the flavor. Your, your end flavor you're going to get out of whatever fruit and vegetable you cook, whether you're, it's going to come out raw or whether it's going to be caramelized or what, mm -hmm. just so you can accentuate it with whatever chocolate you bring into it. Okay. And can, can you throw, share with us – sorry. Oh, can I throw in one quick comment? Of course, Rich. Um, one of the things that, that Jeff has, does very well with chocolate that we learned along the way with savory is you might think that you bring chocolate in to make things sweeter. Mm -hmm. We actually bring chocolate in to do the opposite. Oh, and he learned wow. that when I gave him the great challenge of making, just because I feel, felt like making him wince one day, of making a savory creme brulee for lunch. Wow. And what we learned is, hey, you made an herb creme brulee with, with vegetables, and then we brought in a very, very dark, like 100% into it. it just wow. Chocolate. And we found that we actually can use chocolate to remove sweetness from things, the same way we can use just sweeten, sweeten things. Yeah. Okay. Do you, but do you use the 100%? to do that, or can you use some chocolate that's not 100%? Um, it, it, it's tough. Normally, if we're trying to bring, like, take away the sweetness from a dish, we use a dark that has a lot of like, really more does. subtle notes, like maybe smoky, but mm -hmm. if, let's say I got like a soup, and it's like, it's kind of where I want it to be, and we can get a little sweeter, I'll bring a milk into that. Normally, um, the whites work really well in soups. Oh, wow. Sounds divine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, can you tell us what are some of your favorite chocolates for savory dishes or for savory cooking? Yeah, um, really, really like the Ivoire, that, that white chocolate. That goes really well because um, a lot of it also plays into the final appearance of the dish because if you have like a really bright, beautiful dish and you bring in a dark chocolate, it's just going to look brown. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a lot of the times the, the whites work really well and, and they don't do anything to muddle the colors, which is really nice. Um, okay. Other than that, it's I don't really have a favorite. It's just whatever 
pairs well with the dish. Okay. And what advice would you give chefs who might be interested in cooking with chocolate? The biggest thing is knowing the science of chocolate because the very first thing Rich ever told me when I first started was do not get water anywhere near tempered chocolate. And I've never done that and I know it would seize up immediately but um, I've just been perfecting my mousses. I've been trying to make my mousse really well and just knowing the science and the process of how whatever you're cooking is going to mix with the chocolate. Like a lot of the times it's really easy if you're making a soup or like the chutney we just made where it's warm and you just put chunks in and it'll melt in. But also, like I said, it has to do with how you want the final dish to come out and where you want the chocolate to shine. Okay, so really understand the chemistry behind mm -hmm. what's going on, on in your pan. Exactly. Right? Yeah, we had some early learning about ganaches, where, where Jeff would make a quick ganache, and then the next day it would be, of course, solid as a rock. Uh, we had to do a little bit about you know, about how to make basic ganaches that yeah. would hold. <laughs> yeah, because usually in a restaurant you're making something very good. You're whipping out a ganache. You know, it may be to drizzle on a plate or something else. It doesn't have to really be at the same quality that we as chocolatiers have to make. Mm -hmm, exactly. Things we're doing often, we do have to get. We don't still don't get that quality. We have to get a lot closer. Mm -hmm. And Rich, um, I really want to talk a little bit about the boot camp. You are the flavor coach for the Ecole de Chocolat boot camp. Um, what does that mean for those of us who haven't taken the program? Oh, the boot camp is awesome. Um, Pam introduced it, it in January. Like it. Pam introduced it in January. She asked me to coach it, and I, I got access to the lectures and, and started going through them, and I think they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, the way she approaches it is, is really there's a lot of physiology. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're going to learn what taste, how taste works, you have to learn how you taste things and how you experience Absolutely. them. And there's, and once we have that down, we can start talking about enough about cacao and chocolate to understand where flavor comes from, and then we can talk about regions and varietals. And what's nice about the course is you can be pretty shallow mm -hmm. if you just want to learn to taste. There's a lot of tasting that we do through the course. I provide a lot of feedback, and we try to make tasting more of an experience than just tasting. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also get very deep. I mean, there are some nice papers, you know, the, the genetic paper on, um, on cacao origins um, to a paper that I've added. It's a beautiful paper on, on the um, atomic structure of, of crystallized cocoa butter. Wow. It's really unusual and, and what allows us to do what we do. And all those things really are brought into the class. So we go mm -hmm. from tasting to at the end we go through from what you should experience with chocolate to what you experience from a chocolatier. Uh, and it's it's a really nice nice class. And what I like about it also is it's very much unlike your other classes. They go at your own pace. You start when you want. You take as long as you want to do it. And you go as deep or not deep as you want to go. And uh, it, it's neat. We're, we're tweaking the class right now, but we bring in more photos from on the ground. Um, we have some really neat people in the course who are contributing. And it's, uh, it's fun. I would recommend that will be my next course, <laughs> for sure. We look forward to having you. <laughs> it sounds really fun. Um, so we are running a little bit behind schedule. Um, we've had a really great conversation. But I would really love to um, hear from you guys what chocolate flavors we can expect from Dents and Lion for the upcoming holiday uh, festivities of Easter and Passover. Well, of course, being New Hampshire and it being running a little bit late on spring here, um, we don't have much to work with yet, but I do have some beautiful tangerines and yuzus from my in-laws' trees in California. Oh, wow. Yuzus going into a lot of stuff. Yeah, we never seem to be at a shortage for citrus fruit in the uh, dancing line <laughs> chocolate kitchen. Um, when it, whenever it comes to food, I mean, there's really nothing to expect. Just think seasonal, think bright, yeah. beautiful flavors, and that's all we ever put forward. Nice. We don't plan ahead, and since we don't have to because we get something and we immediately make something from it, we really don't have any idea. Okay. So are you guys going to taste um, your dish? I haven't seen you taste your dish yet. Oh, we better taste the dish and see yes, how we get it. please. <laughs> we'll pretend we're passing you one. <laughs> please. Okay, so we have Did some little crackers here. The, with, uh, the chutney's beautiful. It looks lovely. It sounds divine. <laughs> it's the crunch. I don't think a little bit more chocolate would have hurt it. No, it's very fresh. It's very fresh. Okay. The is nice. 
and uh, time with mango. It's not something I would have thought of right off, right off that, that Jeff decided to do. Actually, yeah, I, I was honest, thinking that mint originally, and then I, I, I thought time would be much better. There's a lot of the stuff that happens with it. You get, the mango is, is really deep and bright, mm -hmm. and the tomato actually I think gives a lot of the brightness too. And try without the cracker because that okay. the cracker definitely Thank you. brought some nuttiness into it. <laughs> they are golden tomatoes, right? So they're a little bit mm -hmm. more, a little bit the brighter. Chocolate. The chocolate. Okay, now I'm getting the chocolate, and the is it, it develops because this chocolate is mostly aroma. It's coming okay. in the back of my throat. I wouldn't tasting this. I would never say, oh, there's chocolate in here if I just tasted it. Interesting. But I can okay. I can definitely tell it's there. It's filling okay. the back of my throat with that same sort of almost smokiness that's just adding another really dimension to the whole thing. Very smoky. A lot a lot of the times you don't necessarily bring the chocolate in in order to accentuate the chocolate. You, yeah. you sometimes we bring it in almost like as a as another spice where if you were to use like four or five spices in a dish, mm -hmm. the subtle undertones of the, the chocolate bar is really good with doing that. Like the Guatemalan white in the last soup that we did. Oh. It's like you would never know there was like a lot of white chocolate in there, but there was like a smoky, subtle, sweet creaminess. Just that, obviously, the soup already had, but it just accentuated it so much where people were blown away. Okay, well, I'm gonna try that one this weekend, <laughs> and I'll let you know how it goes. We'll um, about this recipe and try to get it up on the Google Hangout site pretty quick. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be really wonderful. But I want to close with a thank you to you guys. Um, Richard Tango Lowey from Dancing Lion Chocolate and Savory Chef Jeff Volkers. Did I say that right? Volkers? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> from Dancing Lion Chocolate for taking time out of your busy day to join in on our conversation and helping us all to know what it takes to be a chocolate store. Um, thanks for watching and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.